Good day, fellow investors. Welcome to the stock market news with a long-term fundamental twist. And when it comes to fundamentals, recently the market has been focused on something completely different. I have seen headlines like market slump and YouTube, of course, all thumbnails with crashes, crashes and crashes. But if I take a look at the long-term S&P 500 chart, I don't see any crash here. Do you see it? I see the COVID crash, okay? I see the trade tension, higher rates crash or correction we can say. Then I see the financial crisis crash and the dot-com bubble crash and that's it. Of course if I put it to a month then yes stocks have crashed in a month 2%. Oh my god, 2.36%. And we are where we were a month ago. So yes, a lot of talk about crashes, but it's not a real crash. However, there are some pockets of the markets that are much more sensitive to what's going on. And that's also what we're going to discuss today, discuss what the Fed said, interest rates, bond yields, how those affect the volatility in the market and the riskiness of different market pockets. And then we're going to conclude with what is investing, what you can do, what you can know, what you can't know, so that you know your strategy when it comes to structuring your portfolio. And tomorrow we're going to discuss value stocks, Warren Buffett buys, I'm going to look at the five recent buys. So I hope to give you value with that long-term investing value. And if you get value from that, please click that like button and consider subscribing if you haven't yet. Thank you for your support. So of course, tech stocks lose 1.6 trillion in worst streak in six months. And if we look at the long-term chart, here we see the dot-com crash, the financial crisis crash, correction, crash, and here we see a dip. Okay, this is perhaps something, if I put it to six months from the peak, the Nasdaq is down 8%. So tech stocks are a little bit more sensitive to what's going on and that's what we are going to explain. 8%, okay, we are where we were, what was this? at the beginning of the year. So zero returns for two and a half months. That's not a tragedy, that's not really a crash. But things are moving, some factors are moving, and that's what we have to see. If we look deeper into tech stocks, the high flyers of 2020, there we can also call a lot of things a crash because it's down more than 20%. Tesla is very sensitive to what's going on. And we can see that the market capitalization went from 850 billion to 550 billion. That is a huge decline and you can call it a crash. However, we are still above September levels. So still really, really great performance. Green energy stocks have also declined significantly compared to the S&P 500, but you can see also high flyers earlier. ARC positions, especially the smaller ones, are really, really doing bad as the outflows are there. And you can check my flow ARC video from the beginning of this year that indicated these risks that are happening. Plus, as it is a flow play, and you will see that in the other video, then also as things start to get bad, more and more shorts come in and increase that reversal in flows and you can see the total put open interest for ARC has really exploded and the volume too. Also specs, index, high flyers are also reverting. Why is this happening? Well, the Fed recently just had an interview and they didn't say nothing new. They say they will keep loose monetary policy because unemployment is not where it has to be. And now the market is weighing, okay, loose monetary policy, more money. There is the risk that pockets of the economy or the whole economy starts overheating. We see more inflation, higher interest rates, higher yields, which then in turn affects the required returns from the market. And Powell said that we are still far from full economic activity and employment so that they are going to keep the current policies and they are not going to intervene into the growing interest rates, the growing bond yields, which then 
puts pressure on the market. And before discussing the bond yields, as we are a long-term channel, let's discuss this. The, the Congressional Budget Office recently published the 2021 long-term budget outlook. And this is very important for the long-term outlook on yields. Because if we look at the deficits, expected deficits, over the next decade for the budget, we are 3 trillion, 2 trillion, 1 trillion, and then 1, 1, and then higher, higher, and higher to almost 2 trillion in 2031. These are the linear projections. As a percentage of GDP, they expect not that big of a jump, but they expect huge GDP growth. And you can see here, linear expectations, stable GDP growth with no recessions over the next 10 years. This is always how they make estimations and I'm going to show you why they're always wrong. This is a nice chart from the Wall Street Journal. So these are the estimations now up to 2030 relatively stable and then again linearly or exponentially we can call it increase to 200% over 20 years. And look at this how perfect this projection is. But if we just go back, stable, 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 bomb, financial crisis from 35% debt to GDP to 70, then it's stabilized for a few years. And then we have the COVID crisis, bomb, 70, 100%. So if someone tells me that everything is going to be stable for 10 years, and I look at what history tells me, I don't really believe it, especially as the fundamentals are deteriorating and we're going to discuss that now. So again, here we see the chart booming, booming, and then linearly up. But we have primary deficits coming, more and more net interest to be paid on the debt that increases the total deficit. And when you see that a country will have bigger and bigger deficits, you know that it is very unlikely that this will hold forever. And this is also the problem with the market and something that's going on. If we look at the current market environment, everybody is concerned about inflation, higher rates, overheating economies, uh, higher commodity prices. But a few months ago, five months ago in September, nobody was concerned about that. So these are the cycles of sentiment in the market that now we focus on this and everybody's focused on that. Nobody is focused on the deficits. Maybe in 2023, everybody will be focused on the deficits. That will again put a different pressure on the markets, on the Fed and the decision-making processes. So my message is very clear when it comes to macroeconomics. You never know what will happen. We as long-term investors have to see what are the fundamental risks out there and then just think, what if this happens? What if this happens? What if this happens? Probabilistically, it doesn't matter what is the chance. If something there is a 5% chance that it happens and then it actually happens, then if you are not prepared for that, then you have a 2009 financial crisis in your portfolio. And that's something you don't want to have. As investors, long-term investors, we want to be prepared for anything that can happen. And that's why I do these macro videos so that you can see, okay, am I prepared for this? If this happens, I'm okay. If this, okay. If this, okay. If this, okay. Just to discuss the risks and then be prepared for anything. Outlays are going to grow revenues. And if somebody tells me that this is sustainable over 30 years, it might be, but it might also not be the case. Further, if we look at annual growth, of GDP, the real and the potential, it's declining, declining, declining. So this is the best estimate they can get. And if we have a few recessions, it might not be 1.6, it might be 1.2 on average. And that would be, again, very detrimental to budget deficits. And these estimations might also be much different. Then if we have revenues that need to be increased, higher taxes, because of deficit concerns, then you know what happens to risky investments. Now, talking about yields, look at their expectations, the CBO's expectations on 10-year treasury yields. So 4% over the last 30 years on average, they expect 
2%, 1.5% on the debt held by the public over the next 10 years. So the current situation to be stable for 10 years, despite the increasing deficits, then yes, a little bit higher from 2030 to 2040, and then even higher from 2042 to 2051. So what if we have this here? What if yields go up next year? It can happen. So that's always the issue with these kind of projections. They don't know what will happen. If you look at the projections from 10 years ago, they didn't project 2-3% over the last 10 years, they projected higher. And then there is always the Fed's dilemma. How much can we keep loose monetary policies without pushing these other forces, inflation, higher yields, that are then again detrimental? And the Fed has to decide at one point whether they are going to keep doing what they are doing, destroying market efficiency, destroying price recovery, or at some point they are going to say, okay, now we have to let the natural forces prevail because it's best for the long term. The more they keep kicking the can down the road, the worse will the deficits and the situation be long term. That's a fact. And we have seen recently the market is already starting to price in the, the loose monetary policies, the stimulus, and the 10-year treasury yield is gr going higher and higher. We are already 1.5. The 30-year not yet updated. This is free March. It even went higher after the speech, 2.3. But if it returns higher, and maybe it can go even higher. It was four, five, six percent. If we look at high yield bonds, so risky junk debt, it is still at the lowest points in history. It has rebounded a little bit from four percent to four point four percent, but this is still very, very good for companies, and that's why the Fed is not interested in intervening because. 4.3% for high yield debt is really, really low. As we have seen, averages are usually much, much higher. And in bad periods, even 9%, 10%, 20% is not unusual. 12% for high yield debt during the dot-com bubble. But if this starts to revert and companies start to go bankrupt, then we have another issue. So this is another issue for the next years, I think it will be an issue because you can see the normal volatility there. Higher yields, of course, higher mortgage rates, which lead to difficulties in purchasing homes, lower real estate prices. And that's also something to puzzle into the policy decisions there. And investments that have lofty valuations are risky and are really hit by these changes in interest rates because high valuations are usually based on promises, long-term promises. And then you have to always see, okay, what is the market pricing in? In order to grow long-term, you need to finance the growth. You will be unprofitable for a very long period of time. You need to issue debt. You need to issue capital. And then it's always the question is there, what is the return the market will be asking there? For example, if a company has a price earnings ratio of 100 estimated over the very long term, then that's a business yield of 1%. But if interest rates go to 1.5%, from 1 to 1.5, then the company, the price of the stock, let's say, goes down to a P ratio of 66. Just an increase from the required yield from 1% to 1.5% crashes the security for 33%. And that's why you see this volatility in the market. And that's because you have this high sensitivity. With low interest rates, you have high sensitivity. If high yield bonds go from 4 to 6 7%, a lot of companies that have gone on the debt bonanza over the last years will be in trouble and that's when the Fed will have to intervene with more deficits, with more money printing and that's when the market might not agree with that higher yields and then you have that spiral of inflationary risks that might emerge. And as an investor, I don't know if the Fed will be able to control it or not. 
I want to be positioned so that whatever happens, I'm good. And this leads to the key investing concept. What is your wealth, your portfolio wealth positioned on? If you are positioned on low interest rates, staying there forever, then you are in a very risky position because higher interest rates might lower the portfolio value. If you are positioned on a value perspective where you don't really care about the portfolio value, but you care about what the businesses are producing and can produce in whatever macroeconomic environment, then you are a value investor and then you know you are okay. And in that light, we are going to discuss tomorrow, uh, tomorrow and the day after are likely to two videos, the recent five Warren Buffett buys where he sees value from his portfolio. So the Pharma, Chevron and Verizon to see, okay, what kind of value does he see there? What kind of returns are there now? Because Warren Buffett always buys returns at the moment. And then we can compare it to the lofty valuations to the risks in relation to interest rates. And you will see what kind of vehicles might lead you to your financial goals. Because you have to be sure to reach those financial goals. This is what I'll do over the weekend. Research Warren Buffett's buys. If you get value from these videos, please click that like button. I'm looking forward to your comments and I'll see you tomorrow with Warren Buffett's stocks to give a perspective between value investing and the current market environment. Thank you.